I see myself. I finally saw all the Marvel films just because of that. Constantly, like, oh my god! Yeah. All right. The weaponry. You don't about. have slides, do you? So this is quite. I, I'm not. No. No. Cool. Okay, over to you, Jamie. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Right. We finally got you here. Okay. Right. So um, the great thing about coming at the end is that pretty much everything I was going to say has been covered. So um, I, you just look at this image behind me, if you like. Now, I'll tell you what you haven't covered. You haven't covered Brian Burgess, my father-in-law. Brian Burgess... Um, uh, Parent report, his school report from 1943. Brian's no longer with us, bless him. But we found this. So it, this is how you do a school report, people. If you're not doing it like this, you're doing it all wrong. Um, Brian Birch, aged 11. So key stage two. Uh, and 1943, the one that really stood out, uh, the one that really stood out was art. Right, art, it says, I quote, disgusting work. More interest will produce better results. Um, but but it says at the bottom, Brian is getting along nicely. So there you go. That's how you do a parent report. Um, right. So as I say, a lot of the things I was going to talk about have already been talked about. Um, so the things I do want to talk about, and I am probably going to be going over the ground that Cristalo and, and, and others, Mark, have, have, have already mentioned, and Kulvan as well. Um, it, it's about accountability and it's about progress measures and it's about statutory assessment, but not so much statutory assessment, but but what the data is is used for. That's the kind of that's the thing that I have the problem with. So it's not so much that there is a foundation stage profile, which I think you know a lot of uh, reception teachers are, are fine with. It's it's what that data, that percentage achieving good level of development is um, is useful. It's not the fact that it could be a, a diagnostic assessment of, of phonics. It's what that data is useful. It's not the fact that I mean, all schools are doing multiplication checks anyway. It's not the fact you can have a diagnostic assessment of multiplication check. It's what that data could be used for. It's not the fact that you've got tests at key stage two. Um, it, it's what the data is used for. And that's particularly pernicious. That's the particular problem, because, of course, that feeds into the performance tables. And it's the performance tables that I have a real problem with, because all of that data in the performance tables gets neatly packaged, wrapped up with a neat little bow on top. And it's just like really, really complicated data that gets boiled down to a single number in the case of a secondary school, you know, minus 0.5 or whatever. Um, or in a primary school, you get these three measures reading progress, writing progress, maths progress, minus 1.8, plus 1.7. I, I, I pick that particularly because I always like it when there's a massive differential uh, between what you get in reading and what you get in writing. And we'll get on to the, the, the issue of um, how assessment, uh, how, how high stakes accountability distorts um, teacher assessment in a minute. But they get they get boiled down to these single numbers Education, seven years of education in the case of a primary school gets boiled down to three digits that is then color coded. And, and the, the, the complexity of that measure, what goes on behind that measure? No one has a clue. Hardly anyone. I mean, there, there, there are plenty of senior leaders that don't fully understand how value added is calculated, let alone governors and parents. Um, and so it's all neatly packaged and it's color coded and it says this school is below average. No one has a clue about the disadvantage of the school necessarily or, or the, 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 the special educational needs or, or, or you know, or the, basically the population, the school, uh, the fact they've got a resource base there that, that is uh, catering for is supporting children with found multiple special educational needs. Those children feed into their progress measures. That's not there's no context. It's just data. Data without context is a really dangerous thing. And that's my problem. I, I and the, the the crazy thing is that it, it affects house prices. Even people go through parents jump through hoops to try and get their kid into that school and avoid that school on the basis of a single Ofsted report and, and things like performance tables. It's pernicious and it's dangerous and it's deeply worrying. So um, I had a few things. I, this is a bit of a, as you can imagine, it's, it's a bit of a ramble chat, this Um so I, I've got some things that I was uh, going to I haven't got slides, which, you know, I know there's been a few problems with slides, but I'm going to read this. This actually is a slide. Um, so I'm going to read this. It says here, uh, when used effectively, assessment helps pupils to embed knowledge and use fluently, use it fluently. Right. Assess teachers in producing clear st uh, next steps for pupils. However, assessment is too often carried out in a way that creates unnecessary burdens for staff and pupils. It's therefore important that leaders and teachers understand its limitations 
data assessment, whatever, data de uh, derived from assessment has limitations uh, to avoid misuse and overuse. But that's what's happening with the performance tables. It's too much reliance on data, single bits of data that is then used to judge the performance of a school. That is from the Ofsted handbook, unnecessary burdens on teachers. Teachers are collecting vast amounts of data in some schools. There is a mantra of measure more, more often, as if that's the way to improve a school. Measure more, more often. If you're a school in RI, and we've heard about some schools that are in RI today, if you're a school that's in RI, you're going to get someone come along, maybe a, a school improvement advisor comes along, and as Kulvan said, they come along and you say, look, this is what we're going to do. Go, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that. No. What you're going to do is this. And the first thing you do is you're going to have this tracking system and you're going to track everything that moves. And if it doesn't move, you're going to track it until it damn well does. You're going to set up massive lists of learning objectives, which you're going to score and rag rate. And you're basically measuring progress, progress on a micro scale. But some sort of, I can't remember who it was. It might be Mark. It's already alluded to this. Progress is not linear. It's a multifaceted thing. It's, it's not it's not three dimensional, four dimensional. Well, I don't know, five dimensional if that even exists. It, it's incredibly complicated. I think there's an increasing realization that progress, despite how inconvenient this is, progress can't be measured. Yet progress measures are front and center in the performance tables and they are used to judge the standards in schools. And, and in order to try and second guess those measures, in order to try and predict those measures, in order to try, try and predict attainment and progress in advance, teachers are collecting vast amounts of data. So that, that sentence I just read out is from the Ofsted handbook. I mean, Ofsted now aren't even engaging with internal assessment data because they know that, let's face it, it can all be made up. For years, they've been going into schools and being shown spreadsheets and tracking systems. They go, oh, look, everything's fine. Look, everything's fine. One, there are two rules of tracking systems. I'm going to forget them. There's one rule is the numbers always go up. And there's the other rule is no one ever questions the validity of the numbers. And I think that we were in that world for a very long time. When we had levels, levels were nice, broad, simple, convenient assessments of children's attainment at the end of key stage. And they were kind of fit for purpose for that. But the rot really set in when we started to use them for measuring progress. So uh, you, you had a level two at the end of key stage one and you had a level four at the end of key stage two. And you go, oh, well, someone said, oh that's two levels of progress then. two levels of progress. That's our expected progress. And is it? I thought, um. I suppose so. Yeah. Well, we could have a measure and then let's split them into sub levels because one the levels are too broad to measure progress over short periods. Let's split into sub levels. All right. Let, let's split them into sub levels. We'll have uh, 2C, 2B, 2A. For, so we'll, we'll split them in sub levels. So now we're talking about two whole levels of progress over key stage uh, over key stage two. Bingo. Brilliant. OK. How about we put some point scores? Let's let's give them some scores. And I don't know why a 2B was assigned 15 and a, a, two, a 4B was assigned 27. I don't know where those numbers came from. Maybe some, someday someone might be able to tell me. But some bright spark realized that if you subtract 15 from 27, you get 12. And 12 divided by four years of key stage two is three. And three divided by the three terms in a year was one. One point of progress became like this, this orthodoxy. One point of progress is what children made. No, they didn't. No, in order to get one point of progress, that was half a sub level. So we had to like splitting the atom. We had to split the sub level in half. And we ended up with two B pluses. And we were convincing ourselves that we knew the difference in a two B and a two B plus. No one knew what a two B plus was. It was a complete confection in order to satisfy the demands of external agencies, in order to give the impression that children were making these micro steps of learning that didn't really exist. Well, you certainly you couldn't measure. There was something in the Commission on Assessment Without Levels report that said sometimes progress is simply about consolidation. How do you measure consolidation? It's completely at odds with the measures that we put in place, which are just basically based on how much of the curriculum was being covered. And we measured how much of the curriculum was being covered by ticking off all these massive lists of learning objectives. Solomon Kingsnorth on Twitter pointed out that if you have 30 learning objectives for reading and another 30 for writing and for maths, that's 90 objectives. And if you multiplied that by 30 children, you've got 2,700 assessments. And if you did that three times a year, that's 8,100 assessments, which is absolutely bonkers. But that's really, really common in primary schools. I don't think that sort of thing's going on in secondary. Secondary schools do their own crazy stuff. Secondary schools have flight paths. 
So flat, where they, 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 they are either working towards GCSE grades or working at GCSE grades. You've got children in year seven that are either working towards a grade nine or currently if they were to take their GCSE would get a two. Either way, it's bonkers. GCSE grades don't exist in key stage three. It's completely inappropriate. But schools are now subdividing GCSEs into like four minus four equals four plus and stuff like that. It's all about this incessant need to measure progress over short periods. But for who? Those numbers are meaningless. They, the, the whole thing about the, the flight path, someone asked me about what I thought about flight paths recently. It was on Twitter. And I said, I can't throw my weight behind straight lines drawn between two set data sets of made up numbers. It's complete garbage, absolute garbage. Stop doing it. Stop doing this stuff. Goes back to here about unnecessary burdens. Teachers are spending hours and hours and hours ticking off boxes and basically making up numbers just to keep somebody else happy. It's unacceptable. So that has to stop. Also on here, I've got some types of assessment are capable of being used for more than one purpose. This is from the Commission on Assessment Without Levels 2015. We've had five years to absorb this. However, this may distort the results. Accountability, basically accountability eats itself. What have I written here? Accountability relies on accurate data, but but accountability, the very nature of accountability, distorts the data that it relies on. So it distorts the accuracy. I need accurate data to measure things, but but in the measuring of things, I, I risk the distorting of the data because people start to make things up, which is why Ofsted now no longer look at internal tracking data, because they know... I, I heard Sean Harford say this at a conference. Let's face it, it could all be made up. You know, basically, we had this problem in primary schools and no doubt in secondary schools where 85 percent of children were at age related expectations in year three. Eighty five percent of children were at age related expectations in year four. And 85, it's always 85 percent, by the way. Eighty five percent of children were at age related expectations in year five. And then 52 percent meet expected standards at the end of key stage two. Because if you're a key stage, if you're a year six teacher, you can't hide. So. Uh, I was reading something. Uh, some types of assessment are capable of being used for more than one purpose. However, this may distort the results, such as when an assessment is used to monitor pupil performance. But it's also used as evidence for staff performance. Using staff's own data is basically their judgment, their opinion of a child's learning. But also I'm going to base my judgment of how well you perform as a teacher on that. So hang on. My pay rise is based on the data that I myself put into that tracking system. Yeah. So the more I press this button, what, the more money I get? OK, of course, it gets distorted. It's going to happen. Jamie, can I? Yeah. Just, we are loving this rant, mate. I am literally loving this. Carrie, I, I just love the fact you like throwing papers around as well. It's like, you know, the doc doc of Back to the Future. Like, I've weird. got more paper. Yeah, keep going. And also read the comments because people are making comments as well as you run. If I read the comment, I'll just get distracted. I'll look <laughs> at it then. I'd look at the comments at the end. <laughs> so um the work the making data work report, which I also printed out, but I can't be bothered to no page 17 of the make that's a whole thing on using assessment to monitor teachers' performance, right? So don't do it. You can't base a teacher's performance on the outcome of one test. It's ridiculous. So don't do that. I'm not anti-test. I'm not anti-accountability. It's it's not it's not that. It's just that you you can either have accurate data or you can use it performance management. It's up to you. You cannot think that by using teachers' own assessments. I mean, the outcome of a test is bad enough because you could say, oh well, we use standardized tests. Then we use standardized tests to monitor teachers. Well, they're just going to teach the test. You can't have it both ways. You want what you need your tracking system to be and your test to be is an accurate warts and all picture of children's learning. And you won't get that if you also link it to school performance and to uh, teacher performance. It says here. Um, so, yeah, then it goes on to say, don't use it for multiple purposes. Be really or don't not just be really careful using assessment data for multiple purposes. But that's exactly what the performance tables does. That's exactly what ASP does. That's exactly what the IDSR does. It's data. There's no context there. They just chuck out the numbers and people start moving house. It's bonkers. Um, this one is uh, also from the Commission on Assessment Without Levels. An effective in-school summative assessment is one that provides schools with information they can use to monitor and support pupils' progress, attainment and wider outcomes. Yes, it is. It's not 
the main purpose is not to measure to uh, measure teachers performance and measure school performance you can't have it both ways and if you want good proof of this that there you go that's that's the perfect hang on which direction it's like a mirror isn't it? i'm going the wrong way that is the best example look at me peering around the corner that's the best example of where high stakes accountability and data reliability meet and how the reliability of data is distorted by high stakes. That's the distribution of phonics scores nationally. Spot the expected standard like that. That number. Oh, gosh, get the scale. Um, this scale here. That's the number of children in thousands nationally who achieved each of the marks. So that's zero. One, two, three, four, five. The pass mark, by the way, is 32. Can you spot where 32 is? I always wondered what that would look like. That graph is absolutely nuts. It's the most bonkers graph I have ever seen. My wife's a secondary maths teacher. She teaches A-level maths. You show that and you think, what? That's ridiculous. That's what happens when you have uh, an assessment, a, a teacher assessment, basically. I mean, it is an assessment. It's a standardized assessment. It goes up a cliff at 32 because that's the pass mark. What would that graph, what would this graph look like? My voice is going up an octave now. What would that graph look like if no one collected the data? It wouldn't look like that. I don't believe it would look like that. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have uh, accurate, reliable assessment data and use it for performance management. Well, you have to have very tightly controlled conditions, which is what we obviously we try to do with Key Stage 2 and we try to do with uh, GCSEs. We know there are cases of maladministration that go on. And there have been cases of maladministration at Key Stage 2. When you're desperate, when you're up against the wall, are you surprised that this happens? I'm not against Key Stage 2 tests. What I would rather see is sampling, to be honest. We do it for Key Stage 2 science. And that's a good example. The percentage of children that pass the, the science test when it's sampled against the percentage that uh, uh, pass it in terms of teacher assessment. It's about 30% pass the test and 80% children nationally are passed pass based on the teacher assessment. So there's a huge differential there. It's absolutely crazy. If they just, if they want to monitor the effectiveness of the, the, the you know, the, the, the curriculum and national standards and gaps between disadvantaged groups and others, you sample, that's what you do. You base it on a sample. That's what standardized tests from NFER or whatever you do. They create a stratified sample and you reference children's results against that sample to see where they fit in the national cohort. You could do that nationally. They do it with science. They could do others. Obviously, you then wouldn't be able to hold schools to account on the basis of that data. But I just think that the situation as it stands is incredibly risky. So um, that was just a, a, a rant. And I, I've completely lost track of what I was going to say. Um, but I think the specter of performance tables haunts us all. And it, it, it gets schools to do crazy things. It gets schools to collect too much data. There's too much tracking going on. There's too much data collection. There's uh, measuring progress. I mean, reception year. I've seen reception year where, they, where they've got statements, statement banks, to track against for every one of the 17 early learning goals that when you multiply it by the number of terms and the number of children came to 45 and a half thousand assessments. No one's going to do that. No one's going to spend their lives ticking off learning objectives. So what do teachers do? They go, oh, I've got to do that. I've got to do that by next week. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just log in on a Friday night and I'll just block fill the lot and then I'll just tweak a few to make it look like I put some thought into it. That is not gap analysis. You can't go and tick off a load of boxes and then think it's going to tell you something you didn't already know when it's based on what you knew in the first place. It's about it's about audit and it's about control. And teachers, I think, are so now it's like Stockholm syndrome. They've been doing it for so long that they think they can't see beyond it. They think this is what I need to do. Can I to monitor children's progress? Can you hear me? Hello, yes. Yes, okay. Um, I was just going to say that, do you think one of the problems is that between, so for example, at secondary level, obviously I'm a secondary teacher, okay? So if we take the example of history, for example, which is obviously what I teach, yep. student does an essay, right? Yep. And, uh, or, or an exam question that is an extended writing question, 16 marks, let's say, right? Yep. I mark it for that student and they get 12 out of 16, okay? Yep. Four weeks later, and this 
on, unless I'm wrong, most teachers are going to set them a different 16 mark question on a different topic. Yeah. Right? Yes. And and it might be after the holiday. So they yeah, make yeah. less or more revision for that yeah. second test. Yeah. They sit it again. Yeah. And they get two marks less than they did on the first one that they did four weeks ago. And the answer yeah. four weeks ago or six weeks ago. And the answer on that is their progress has dropped. Yeah, that progress is yeah. you're testing different and stuff. It's not even debated. It's that yeah. progress has yeah. dropped because Tom carried out a 16 mark question with that student. He got 10 in the first one, yeah. he got eight in the second one. What that literally to me, and that it has been my 15 years, yeah. that hasn't really significantly changed. Apart from maybe the schools that have put less emphasis on that and have seen the learning over time more. So what's the answer to that? How why? How do we have so many people in the system who still look at things that way? What's the answer to it? Right. Ofsted, really doesn't help, does it? Ofsted aren't helping. Well, Ofsted, Ofsted have helped in a way by um, the, the, the Ofsted handbook. Yeah. There, there have been some quite subtle tweaks over, over time. So um, yeah. they, 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 in 2017, they, they released an Ofsted inspection, a quarterly update. They bring out this newsletter every, you know, every quarter. And it said... Um, expected progress was an accountability measure until 2015, i.e. the levels measure. The yeah. levels measure was nuts. I mean, the, the levels measure often conflicted with the value added measure because we had two running alongside each other. And you could have a school where 100 percent of children made expected progress, but the value added was significantly below. And you know, how can my progress be significantly below when my progress is expected? What? That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, it said expected progress was an accountability measure till 2015. Ofsted inspectors must not use this phrase when referring to current pupils. So they were banned from using the phrase expected progress because there was a recognition that expected progress didn't exist. Expected progress is you as a teacher know, I expect that child to do that, that child to do that. There's like different routes and different paths to different places or maybe to the same place. Um, so it was there, there was an education data lab report talking about linear progress and it said more children get to the right place the wrong way, which was which was another really good one. There's no such thing as expected progress. You, there is no gradient. I think Mark talked about this. It, it doesn't learning doesn't do that. You don't all have children following this magic line. Oh, it yeah. doesn't happen. But but the people, the powers that be, when you're in this sort of elevated or slightly sort of separate position if you are a, a maybe a head teacher or or a mat ceo even or or a la advisor um you you just want the convenience of numbers yeah yeah, you yeah ignore the reality i want to know i still talk to schools where they're talking about children they start the year um beginning and then they go beginning plus and then they go advancing and advancing plus and then they're secure secure doesn't happen don't have any secure children until after easter and then they're secure plus and then they're deepening and they can make seven points a year. Yeah. There are schools doing this. I mean, levels were bad enough. In order to have 2B plus, we had to split sub levels. And, and I remember an LA advisor saying to coming to me when I worked as a data analyst in a local forest, coming to me and saying, this he explained the whole levels and sub levels and sub sub levels and a point per term without with without a crack of a smile. And he said, That's what that's what children do. And he was absolutely serious. Can you build a spreadsheet? And back then I was quite excited. Oh, yeah, I can build a spreadsheet. I didn't realize I was just feeding the monster. Yeah, yeah. It's absolute garbage. But we got rid of levels because progress wasn't linear and they labeled children and they told us nothing about what children can and can't do and all those other reasons. The progress being linear, that's that was the most that was the that was the big one for me as a data analyst. And we replaced them with something that's far, far worse. Yeah, yeah. I I think Andy, Andy's just said, numbers and they can't let go. Yeah, and Andy Moore's just said as a current CEO, we have to look beyond the numbers, otherwise. Um, we're failing children and teachers. Um, and and it's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, that that's the thing for me is like, it's one dimension, isn't it? But like what I said is, is that primary and secondary, you know, the way that, number one, it's the obsession with measuring and checking. That's number yeah. one. But number two, if you are going to measure and check, the date, the, the exam questions and the way in which you're collecting that has to be reliable. Otherwise it's pointless. Yeah. So, most schools are not collecting data from the students, which actually shows them anything. You know, um, you cannot in a half term judge the progress of a student. No. In a, you, you, I mean, you maybe maybe you can, but you can't do it by doing one test at the beginning and one test at the end that are completely different. 
Um, it, it, unless it's the same test. I mean, you could if it's the same thing, couldn't you, I suppose? You, you asked about um, Ofsted, and I said that they've been on a, been a bit of a journey, the J word. They've been on a bit of a journey. So 2017, they like banned that use of the word expected progress because realising expect, expected progress doesn't exist, and it's a much more individual, individual thing. And then Amanda Spielman gave a speech a year later where she said, um, stop inventing, was it, Byzantine number systems. What we want to do is have conversations with teachers about children's learning, what they expect children to know, how you assess their learning and what you do about it when you find out they don't. And that's much more useful than just basically making some crazy yeah. numbers up. Yeah. So that was really encouraging. And then, of course, that moved on to now where they're not even going to look at your internal data. So if yeah. then I want other organisations, i.e. you know, local authorities, maps and whatever you to follow suit with this. If Ofsted aren't looking at internal yeah. data, that gives us licence to stop creating yeah, right. crazy byzantine number systems because they don't want it no it has no impact on learning the, there is a massive industry going on in generating numbers that have no demonstrable positive impact on children's learning you're yeah. doing it just to keep someone else happy and the big someone else off there aren't even going to look at it anymore. Yeah, yeah, definitely just stop that, doing it some of them aren't aware of that or they don't know that Ofsted aren't going to check internal data or aren't interested in it anymore well it you know i think that's been it's it's in the handbook it's it, yeah. they should know that now um but yeah we, something something's got to give and and there's just way way too much uh, data collection well. I, I i work for a company that provides a popular tracking system for primary schools insight um and and i think it's important to have a i don't like the word tracking system assessment database it's just a database where you store your you know you've got all the contextual information about a child so the whole kind of history around a child can be in there and you can have their prior attainment uh, you know, foundation stage or you know key stage two results all that sort of statutory assessment information can be in there um and and then a load of sort of internal assessment data stop trying to measure progress I and mean, that's big that's the big problem you can't measure progress and even yeah. if you try it will never emulate what the dfe do at the end of key stage two or the end of key stage uh four it, it's it's not going to happen just don't be sidetracked by all that what you want your assessment system to be what you want assessments to be is accurate so stop the stop risking the distortion by using it for accountability and performance management and the dfe need to wake up to this and um and and it's, yeah, so you need and it reduce the workload so stop making pictures tick off vast list basically recreating app um yeah it's even worse than app because app was supposed to be done for for like samples of children yeah, but but in many schools now every single teacher every single child they're they're ticking off all these these learning objectives reduce the workload and reduce the risk of data distortion and ensure that your system is just a it's not about measuring tiny little steps of progress that you can't measure it's yeah. just a collection of really useful accurate information definitely so is is the answer then just to i mean kind of what is the answer then? Is it to just go, we're not going to have, we, we are still going to assess. I mean, every teacher's going to assess still, aren't they? You know, well, I, I, you know, they're still going to set tests. They're still going to set quizzes. They're still going to set questions students are going to do. They're still going to mark them. They're still going to feedback. What we're talking about here is the collection of that data and the use of it to measure is pretty much point. Ask why, ask why you're collecting the data. Yeah, just know deep down. I think sometimes, as I said, there's a bit of Stockholm syndrome going on. You've been doing it for so long that you yeah. think you can't live without it. And sometimes teachers can be their own worst enemies in this. You try and take something away. But when I know head teachers that say we're not going to do that anymore, and they go, oh, oh my god, no, 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 no. I, I think this is a particular problem at the moment in foundation stage, actually, where mm. there's a lot of data collection going on. They're about to have their assessment without levels sort of moment with the new foundation stage profile and the new develop matters framework. And 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 so there's a there's they're, they're all how what how are we going to reinvent all this this kind of hierarchical flight path scale thing we've had for years and we've used and that it's the sort of conversations that schools have been having since like the removal of levels that's yeah. now happening uh there so um i can't remember what i was talking about <laughs> but <laughs> just I, I ask, ask who wants the data why do they need it what's it going to tell you if it doesn't the, the primary purpose of collecting data is to support what does it say support and monitor support and monitor children's learning right that's the primary purpose of of collecting that data the data that you provide to governors and others should be a byproduct of that so you, you don't produce data solely for governor i am a governor i'm a primary school governor and 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 i don't want teachers doing stuff solely to, for me i don't want the head teacher spending hours of their time collecting collating data 
for me, it should be a one click process. It should be, that's where systems come in, but it should be really, really simple. But you design assessment from classroom upwards and what pops out at the top, uh, hopefully, will just presenting like in a primary school, particularly just be presenting like the percentage of children that are working out or above expectations over time, right? As a governor, I don't need to know much about those children that are meeting expectations. My main concern is those children that aren't and whether we're doing the right job by those children in supporting their learning. That's my main concern is asking about how we're supporting those children that are struggling in, in whatever for whatever reason. So the data has to be useful. It has to be accurate um, and, and it has to be uh, proportionate. Um, it's, it, data is useful. Assessment is you're not going to assessment goes on in teachers heads all the time, constantly, every single second that they're in front of children. And when they're not in front of children, they're assessing, 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 assessing. We cannot collect all of that and we must stop trying to collect everything that's in teach, dump everything out of teachers heads onto some kind of spreadsheet, then use that to not only measure children's progress, which can't be done, but to measure their performance, which also can't be done. Yeah, 100 percent. Listen, Jamie, that was absolutely fantastic. I think Flora is exhausted. I don't know. Flora is coming back. Here comes Flora. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it was a good rant. It was a good rant. It was. I heard it all. For some reason. My rant. I just got some random words written on a page and some printouts. Jamie, I always love to hear your rants. <laughs> they never get old. And I seriously don't understand why every head teacher has not heard your rant yet, because everyone needs to hear you speak. Um, because everything you say is absolutely pertinent and relevant to everything we do. Um, and we need to get your voice to the people who make the changes in education. We need to make sure that they hear you because everything you say is absolutely spot on. Um, yeah. I, I, someone asked someone asked on here if I was writing a book. Everyone's writing a book these days, aren't they? I'm writing a book. <laughs> I'm writing a book with Richard Selfridge. Um, and oh, and yeah. that's yeah, data yeah. busting on and he's a fantastic guy. And we've yeah. been doing our data busting roadshow. And obviously we can't do it at the moment, but we've been, you know, we do a podcast. Um, well, usually once a month, but it's slapped a bit. But we've we've done a whole bunch of podcasts, but we are writing a book. In fact, I've been writing a chapter on tracking systems um and what their their actual purpose is and how they kind of bet the farm on on the whole progress incremental progress measure thing when actually that's not what they should be used for so um i've written about standardized tests and about the distortions how data is distorted by external and internal um sort of high stakes and accountability and performance management so yeah we are um writing a, a book about this stuff what's the name of the podcast jamie because i don't know um, data busters oh data busters okay cool yeah cool on like spotify or yeah yeah it's on apple and yeah cool yeah cool but you know actually everything you say as i said is completely pertinent and continue to have the test and we will continue to teach to it in schools that's what happens and i just think how many schools across england have been teaching just to the phonics test in year two since children started back yeah yeah school? yeah I, I, I had an idea. I mean, I, the, I, the key stage, like a sort of halfway house, I think that sampling of key stage two. They, so like all schools could do it or they could be selected to do it. But it, it's how that data is used. So but the other thing is like the, the incessant like SATs practice, which I know there are schools where the SATs practice is creeping back into year five. Um, and you think about what that's doing to the curriculum, particularly in year six, when schools are, you know, they're, and they're, they're monitoring like the scaled scores that children get at each half term to see if it's improving over time. And, and I completely understand why they're doing it. One of the things I thought was, well, sampling would uh, enable the DfE to monitor national standards, but they wouldn't be able to use the data uh, to um, sort of monitor school standards, school levels. So that would kill the performance tables. And I would love to, I think if I could wave a magic wand, if I, I would just get rid of performance tables. I'll just get rid of them, right? Not not necessarily the tests and the statutory assessments, but I would get rid of the performance tables. So that that I would just um, I, I would get rid of. I, I did think that what you could also do is get stop publishing the SATS papers online, right? Yeah. Stop the SATS papers online and take all of the questions and put them. The DfE could build a question bank where you can go in and you can pick and choose the questions that you want to do. So they can practice some questions, but you wouldn't be able to know, you wouldn't know what the weighting is and the scoring, and they wouldn't be able to add it up to a scaled score, and you wouldn't be able to track the scaled scores over time. You would use them for more formative purposes, I guess, but you wouldn't be able to use them for tracking progress um, and standards. I, I don't know, maybe it's a bit radical, but I thought that could be a little halfway house. 
Yeah, I think absolutely it, it is. It's the league tables and everything that comes with it that causes That's all the number one. I know that this government have well they uh, no appetite to do that. Um, I know that the Labour Party and others like the Greens and that they want to get rid of. I think the Lib Dems that they want to get rid of Sats. I'm not sure if I, I what I think about that. Um, I, I I think that they what, what I, I guess what I worry about is that we have a big disadvantaged gap in this country, and we're trying to address that through the people premium and and, and other sort of strategies. How do we monitor that and see if it's working? When it, you know there's a lot of money being spent. And that's a good thing. I think that's that's yeah. a good thing to measure that. What I don't like is the way that they just chuck this data out there and go, this is this school, this is this school. You can create, I'll tell you a little story, actually, before I stop. You can create a, 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 a compare schools table by selecting a whole bunch of schools and you can rank them in order. And of course, this is what like local newspapers do, isn't it? They just go and rank them all in order. We've created our league table of schools, right? So I know a head teacher that came into school one day, he was in his office and there was a knock at the door and a teacher came in and said, I think you need to see what's been pinned on our gate. And the head teacher goes, oh my God, what, what has been pinned on our gate? And she handed over a printout and it was a printout of, from the Compare Schools website, which chose all the local schools in the area and it was ranked by the, G, by the Key Stage 2 results. And she handed it over and the, the, the highest performing school had been sort of circled and a little arrow and it said, well done, Leafy Green Primary School. That's not the name of the school. And then their school was at the bottom and there was like, it was underlined in red and a little arrow pointing saying, what the is this? And it trans transpired, it was a parent of that school so incensed by uh, the results at Key Stage 2 uh, that they, they felt the need to print that out and stick... They had no idea. They have no idea how those measures actually it wasn't. The, it wasn't the percentages achieving. It was based on the progress measures. It was based on the progress measures. They have no idea how progress measures are calculated. They have no idea how they take account of children's special educational needs, how they how the DfE use nominal scores in place of key stage two scores. Like, oh, well, rather than removing those children with EHCPs from the process, right, that don't sit the test. We'll just make up a number for them, which guarantees because of the benchmarking process, it guarantees that they end up with negative scores like minus 15 and sort of crazy numbers. It doesn't take into account any of that. The parents don't know that. They print out this list, stick it on the gate and write rude stuff on it. Mm. Ah, that's what happens. I know I could talk to you all day, Jamie. I love listening to you. It is. And this is, and unfortunately, this is what causes the competition between schools as well. And then, you know, we're all competing against each other, which absolutely yep. goes against everything we've come into education for in the first place. Yeah. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. League tables have got to go. Data needs to be, you need to create the new system. We're going to go by Jamie because you, you'll, you'll have it all sussed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and we need to sort the system out. This is why it's so pertinent that we keep this conversation going. Absolutely. There is a there is a balance to strike in schools with your assessment um, between and it needs to be tipped in favor of 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 like impact on learning. So there's impact on learning and impact on workload. And you've got to tip it the right way. And we have to have really honest conversations, not just amongst senior leaders, but involve others. And we've got to talk because sometimes governors are driving this. Go, oh, no, no. I, we want data that looks like you can't have data that looks like that anymore. And we've had these conversations, haven't we, Flora? Oh, we, we love this conversation. We've had these conversations. So we're, we're not, we're, no, we're not going to do that anymore. That's not what we do. No. 